Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my February 2024 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. If you saw my last weekly wrap-up, you know where I am. I am in the south of England, I'm visiting family, and today is actually a really, really busy day because we're going to the airport later to a different secret, exciting location. So I figured I would film this today so that on Sunday you can see a different location. I'm going to start with my nerdy hardcore stats and charts and then get into what I read. Also, I put chapter markers in all of my videos, so if you need to skip over anything or go back to something to figure out what was the name of that book again, all of that's down below. While you're you're down there please make sure that you are subscribed and also like this video because that really helps me out. As a reminder I will also be updating my bookish bingo board from hell so stay tuned for that at the end of the video. In February I read 11 things for a total of 3064 pages. That takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages so about 1238 of those pages were actually about 40 hours of audio. The age breakdown for these books was 8 adult books, 2 YA books, and 1 kids book. I read 8 novels, two novellas, and one anthology. This month the biggest chunk of what I read was fantasy, mystery, thriller, and romance, followed by horror, historical fiction, contemporary, and non-fiction. If you adjust by page count you can maybe guess which things were novellas. Just over half of these books were from the library, but I also read books from NetGalley, an independent bookstore, and a free little library. I read four ebooks, four audiobooks, one paperback, and one hardcover. The biggest chunk of my books were in the 300 to 399 page range, and the majority were published this decade. Most of my reads were by female authors, and nearly half of the protagonists were female. In terms of setting, half were set in the US, followed by France, Australia, the UK, and other worlds. In terms of diversity of subject matter, the biggest chunk had none, but there was some queer rep, a book concerning race, and an intersectional read. In terms of star ratings, this month I had two 3.5 star reads, six 4 star reads, one 4.5 star read, and two 5 star reads. Let's start with our lowest rated read and work our way up to the highest, shall we? Obviously this was a pretty decent reading month considering it starts at 3.5 star reads, so I really want nobody to get really mad that the first book on this list, and therefore the worst thing I read this month, was a classic, and that was The Little Prince. I decided to pick up a very nice copy of this while I was in Shakespeare & Co. in Paris. Half as souvenir and half to reread it because I have read it before, it's just been a really long time. This story concerns a man who is a pilot and he crashes in the desert and he's trying to fix his plane and while he's doing that, this person that he dubs The Little Prince comes up to him and basically tells him his life story, how he's from this completely different planet and how he ended up here and maybe what's going to happen in the future for him. It is very whimsical, there are parts that are very lovely, there are also parts that are very very sad and you don't exactly know for sure what happens at the end and you can have your own little theory about it, but um, yeah. How do you guys feel about that ending if you've read it before? Let me know down below. My other 3.5 star book was All of Us Villains. This is the first new duology and I wish the library had the second book so I could just figure out what happens with all these characters, but it currently doesn't so we'll figure that out in the future or I'll just never finish it. That's pretty likely actually. <laughs> Not because I didn't enjoy this but because I'm pretty bad at finishing sequels of things in general. This one is set in a world that's kind of like our own except for magic definitely exists, some people use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's kind of a base magic and then there's high magic and there's only one family in this one particular town that has access to the high magic and that's because every generation there is a tournament between these seven influential families to figure out who's going to be the one to control that high magic for the generation. The thing is this is a fight to the death and every generation somebody from each family is put in this tournament and the victor is the last person standing. In this book we have multiple points of view, so points of view of people who are going to be in this tournament, because we start on the lead up to this tournament as people are finding out whether or not they're the victor, and then we also see about half of this tournament and things kind of go sideways as they always will. This is a curse that's been going on for I believe it was like 800 years, but there are some people that just want to get it over and done with and like forget that this tournament ever happened because obviously this is super traumatic, and there's some people that figure that maybe there's a way to actually break this curse, but obviously if nobody's done it in 800 years it's not going to be easy. There were points of this that were fun. I did 
have a little bit of confusion over which character was which every once in a while I'd have to be like oh yeah this is the one that's like this okay continue but I did like that we got to see a variety of different character traits and I would be interested to see how this goes in the second half of the duology but like I said I'm not going to purchase it for myself when my library gets it I should get a notification on my phone but that's if they get it it's not guaranteed that it's going to happen one of my four star reads, the first one being The Little Bookshop on the Seine. You can probably guess why I read this. Oh wait, it's because I went to a little bookshop on the Seine. That was Shakespeare and Company, and that's actually the bookshop that the bookshop in this book is based on, but it's definitely not the exact same shop. Our main character in this one is a small town girl somewhere in the United States. I cannot remember where she's from, but she lives in this very small town. She has her own bookshop. It's not very busy at all, and she gets this call from her friend who owns a bookshop called Once Upon a Time in Paris, and her her friend basically calls her because she's very distraught because the man that she was dating before has run off with somebody else and they keep rubbing it in her face and she just wants to get out of Paris for a while so she proposes a bookshop swap. So essentially our main character who's from this very small town and has never really traveled before is plunked into the middle of Paris and trying to figure out how to manage this very very busy shop. Along the way she makes some friends and enemies, she's got a little bit of a will it happen or won't it happen going on with her boyfriend. It's a cute story. I enjoyed it and I enjoyed reading it while I was in France because it seemed like the best time to do so. There were some things that you just had to ignore if you wanted to enjoy this story, such as she booked a ticket pretty much immediately and was in Paris within a week, which is just not a feasible thing if you're going to be working in a foreign country, let me tell you. Not to mention I don't think this character would have had a passport, which is obviously something she would also need. But if you just ignore little details like that and logic like that, this is an enjoyable enough read. There was one part I remember reading, I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but it was something to do with like people watching mindless TV and how I'd rather read a book instead because books are better. And I'm just like, so people consuming a story in a different medium is worse? Okay, yeah, sure, Jan, that's a great take. Next we have Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. This one I read admittedly a little bit too quickly and a large amount of it was while I was jet lagged so I didn't pick up on all of the details that I probably should have in a book like this but essentially this is about this family reunion and we learned throughout the family reunion that literally everyone in this family has killed someone. But then there's also an isolated murder mystery situation going on and we have to solve that as well. I remember having fun with it. I know that the narration style isn't for everyone because it's very informal and very much like I'm gonna tell you what I can tell you based on what I remember and what I knew at the time in the story and you're just gonna have to listen to me talk about it and so it's very informal in that kind of narration but I found that enjoyable especially as an audiobook. Next we have The Last Housewife. This is about a woman who's been married for about a year and about six months previously she actually quit her job so she could work on her novel which is going so poorly she hasn't written a single word. One day she's listening to her favorite podcast which happens to be a true crime podcast hosted by a childhood friend that she hasn't talked to in a very very long time but as she's listening she finds out that her roommate from college has actually just died under mysterious circumstances. She finds herself booking a flight immediately to go back to where she went to college, a place that she never thought she would go back to, and the story goes from there. She's basically there to figure out what happened with her friend and ends up having to join forces with the previous childhood friend and we kind of figure out what happened in their past, why she never wanted to go back to this place, and the dark things that she's never really told anybody about that occurred when she was in college and just before college as well. Because this has a podcast element there are certain parts of this that she is being interviewed for so you get this narration of how things went in her backstory and I thought that was a really smart way of doing those info dumps. This one definitely gets very dark, very twisty, very much cult-like so if you're looking for something like that pick this one up. Next we have Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Y. Davies. This is a collection or an anthology of different speeches she's given over different times. Basically based around the idea of freedom and how we're not free until everyone is free. How this applies to places like Palestine or Ferguson or how it just applies to different classes of people and how they are treated or mistreated differently. This one is a little bit inside baseball so there will be certain things if you're not well versed in the subject that she'll be talking about and you won't know exactly what she's talking about and you'll have to look them up which also makes it kind of a good jumping off point. 
that. Next we have Meddling Kids. From the title of this one you might be able to guess that it's based around the Scooby-Doo gang, and yes that's accurate except for these aren't the exact characters from that franchise. When they were in their early teen years the Blythe Summer Detective Club solved a lot of mysteries in this one small town that they always went to during the summer. However it's 13 years after they put away their last bad guy who ended up being a guy in a mask, of course, and he's just about to get out of jail for what he did. The makeup of this summer club was of course two boys, two girls, and a dog, and then they had a couple of trusted adults that they would call in once they've solved a case. At this point in our story that dog has actually passed on, but we also get the companionship of his great-great-grandson, who is just a delightful character all on his own. I absolutely love Tim, and I absolutely love when authors treat the animal companions as full-blown characters. It's just so wonderful. But then also one of the gang has also passed away, so when one of them is getting the gang back together because she doesn't actually think that the guy that's getting out of prison did the deeds that he went to prison for, only three out of the original five are able to make it with also Tim, but then one of them has also been institutionalized because sometimes he sees his dead friend, so in theory Pete is there too. This one is full of a lot of daring hijinks and a lot of references to certain media of the time frame, but in ways that they're not directly referencing the certain media, but they're referencing something that's in their universe that is like that media. For example, at one point somebody's watching a television program that is very much like Xena Warrior Princess, but it's actually called Zera Warrior Princess or something like that. And then there are tiny little references here and there that you really have to look for, but if you know what you're looking for, they're great. Such as there was an article written when they were kids, and it was written by somebody by the name of Nancy Hardy, which is obviously just an amalgamation of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys into one pen name. This one is definitely a little bit weird because the bad guy definitely isn't just a guy in a mask. It gets much stranger than that, but also the way this is written is weird because there are certain parts of it that will become absolutely cinematic, and sometimes instead of having dialogue tags we'll just write it out like dialogue from a movie, and then there's also action sequences that are written very much like a script as well. There were a couple of parts where this dragged a little bit for me, but overall I really enjoyed it. Finally for my four star reads we have Second Chances in Newport Stephen. This is all about a trans guy who is going back to his small Florida town for basically the first time in a very long time, especially since he transitioned. But he's going back for basically all of December because one, he wants to see his family, but that's kind of a guise because he's also subletting his apartment because he's recently lost a writing job because the guy that was on the show that he was writing for turns out not to have been a great guy and was doing some very inappropriate things, so basically everybody who worked on the show is out of work now. While he's home he runs into his high school boyfriend who at first admittedly doesn't recognize him, but very quickly does, and then they get reacquainted and it goes from there. His high school boyfriend ends up being a divorced dad who works really really hard at this local restaurant that is basically a staple in the area, and I just really adored seeing these characters reconnect and what came from there. It was just so cute. I really, really adored it. My 4.5 star read this month was Beloved by Toni Morrison. Going into this one, I basically knew nothing except for everybody should read some Toni Morrison, which always puts me a little on edge because I'm always worried that I'm either not going to get it or I'm not going to like it, and then I'm just basically wrong, and I don't want to do that. But I did really enjoy this one. This one is a haunting story, which would have definitely made me read this much faster if I knew that ahead of time. And this one also has a lot of characters to it, so going into it you can get a little bit overwhelmed, but once you realize how these characters all intersect, because we have a present timeline and past timelines, it is pretty easy to follow, but not easy to read, because this takes place in the late 1800s during the time of slavery. Most of the characters in this book were enslaved at least at some point, and there are some incredibly terrible things that happen to these characters, and that one of these characters in particular has done. I don't really want to say more than that, because because the reveal of that is quite heart-wrenching, but if you have anything to do with children that you need triggers for, definitely look up trigger warnings ahead of time, because you will need to know that information. On my five-star reads this month I actually got to read Nick and Charlie, which is one of the novellas in the Heartstopper universe, and it's just a delight. This is just another excuse to hang out with these boys, see how much they're in love, see that they have these character flaws, and there's actually a point in this where it seems like they're going to break up, and it's just so good to be in this universe. I absolutely love this universe 
universe and I'm so excited for the final book in the graphic novel series to come out but then also bummed because then there's no more after that. My favorite thing I read this month seems like it was geared specifically for me and that's called I Only Read Murder. This is actually written by a couple of Canadian brothers. One of them I actually know so I know he has an extensive theater background. And this is all about this aging actress who had this main character role on a TV show about 15 years ago and she's been in Hollywood ever since just trying to get the next big thing and she doesn't book many jobs because obviously once women get to a certain age you just can't book them for things. And one day she gets this postcard telling her it's time to go back to this very small seaside town. When she gets there we as the audience find out something about her that we definitely didn't know going into that point and she also decides to audition for the local theater production. It's a murder mystery play that's very specific to the area of this town which also in turn turns into a murder mystery. Family is playing something musical downstairs. I don't know if you can hear it. It sounds really good but I'm hoping that you can't hear it because I don't know if it's copyrighted material in the background of the video. I don't want to deal with that. This one feels particularly geared to me because there's this essence of this whole true crime thing that's happening while they're there because obviously our main character is trying to figure out what happened in this small town and how this came about but then also it has all of this theater element which is very much my jam. I love books set in and around theater. And then the fact that I also have worked with Ian in the past and I found this in the little free library just before we left this trip absolutely perfect for me. Before I end this I have a couple of updates. Firstly, what I read that covers certain squares on the Read Queer All Year initiative, which are basically mini prompts that we're giving you every month that there isn't an actual round for the Queer Lit Readathon. The board for that looks like this and I was able to actually cross off three of these four squares, which is pretty good considering I'm traveling and only read 11 books this month, which is well under my average when I'm not traveling. Second Chances in Newport Stephen crossed off both Romance and and trans mask, and you can make an argument that freedom is a constant struggle also crosses off black history. As for my bookish bingo board from hell, I did make a little bit of progress, but uh, I haven't crossed anything off yet, but I'm getting really close on some of the squares. When it comes to Book of the Month books and TBR veterans, there's been no change there. However, when it comes to Ignored Arcs, I've now crossed off two that I didn't have before. There's no change for the next two squares, but for the pre-2000 square, I was also able to add two to that total, bringing it up to six. I was also able to add one more book to the non-English speaking countries square, and one more book to my 40 before 40 TBR. Yes, there was a little bit of overlap in all of those things, but it's progressing nicely, which is pretty good, again, considering how little I read this month compared to if I were just at home and reading all the time. If you want to hear me talk more about these books or other books that matter, the playlist for my weekly entertainment wrap-ups is always linked down below. If you've read any of these books and you want to talk to me about them, please do that in the comments down below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a Ko-fi account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that, as always, is down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. And I'm going to be in a completely different country. Bye!